Well, good afternoon. Uh, happy Thursday to you. Uh, Bill O'Leary coming to you once again from Legacy Planning Law Group here. Uh, coming to you here Thursday as part of what we call our Thirsty Thursday series, um, where every Thursday at about this time, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to be talking about a topic uh, that might be interesting to people, a topic that relates to estate planning uh, and elder law and so forth. So, as I like to say, if you're thirsting for knowledge uh, and information, then you have absolutely come to the right place. So, what is today's topic? The, today's topic is how does the Secure Act impact my estate planning? Okay, so. Um, let, let me first tell you real quick what the SECURE Act is. Some of you may have heard it, but uh, many of you may not have. Um, it was a new law passed by Congress, took effect January 1 of this year. And uh, what it did is it dealt with retirement accounts. It changed uh, how we deal with retirement accounts. And it really, it created sort of a mixed bag of, of benefits as well as some new requirements uh, for how Americans save for retirement. Uh, the law was also a way for the government to get access to retirement savings sooner so that money could uh, be taxed. So there, the, there it is again, the government uh, looking for more tax revenue quicker. Anyone hoping to actually be more secure, though, needs to give those benefits and those requirements in the new law uh, a closer look. Now, the SECURE Act's main change, the principal change, affects IRAs and 401ks. Now, before the SECURE Act, before January 1 of this year, you had to start making withdrawals, taking money out uh, of your IRA, if it was a traditional IRA, by April 1, April 1 of the year after you turned age 70 and a half. That was kind of odd, 70 and a half. These annual withdrawals uh, were what we called a required minimum distribution, sometimes referred to as RMDs. Well, now some good news. The SECURE Act now allows another year and a half before the RMD requirement kicks in, uh, changing it from age 70 and a half to age 72. So when you turn 72, now you have to start taking money out of your IRA or your 401k. And of course, you'll have to pay income tax on the amount of those, uh, of the amount withdrawn. By the way, thanks to the recent CARES Act that was passed into law um, uh, over uh, the spring uh, as one of the COVID relief measures, everyone gets to skip their RMDs for this year, 2020. And there's some more good news. The SECURE Act also removed the age limit for IRA contributions. So now you can continue contributing to your IRA at any age as long as you're still working. Uh, now for the tricky part of the SECURE Act. The SECURE Act made a huge change that affects uh, inherited IRAs when an IRA is passed on to, let's say, children. Before January 1 of this year, the beneficiary of an inherited IRA uh, was able to basically postpone or defer a tax on the IRA over their, their lifespan, over their lifetime. And they would do that by taking the RMDs, the required distributions, uh, based upon how, how old they are. The younger the beneficiary, the longer the tax deferral period that, that it can, this is what we used to call the stretch. Now, of course, the beneficiary would still have to pay the income tax on those withdrawals, but in essence, they could spread the distributions out over decades. And this was most often seen where the beneficiary of the IRA was a child. Now, uh, beginning with retirement account owners who pass away after January 1 of this year, most beneficiaries now have to withdraw uh, the, uh, the inherited IRA money uh, within 10 years uh, of the account owner's death. Now, there are some exceptions uh, called uh, eligible designated beneficiaries, what we like to call for short EDBs. These people, these EDBs, retain the ability to defer the taxation over a longer period of time. That is to say, they can still take advantage of the stretch that everyone else had available to them. There are five categories of people. Let me briefly walk through them. The first EDB, the first uh, type of person that can continue to stretch it out over their lifetime is the surviving spouse. Now, a surviving spouse who's a beneficiary of an IRA can roll over the IRA to his or her own IRA or treat that uh, IRA as an inherited IRA. It's a choice that they have. Doing either option will mean uh, that withdrawals will then be calculated over the spouse's remaining life expectancy. This 
you see, stretches out the IRA distributions uh, and, and stretches out the benefits of the tax deferred growth for potentially decades. So uh, that's the first type of um, um, special um, uh, category of EDB surviving spouse. The second type of EDB is a minor child. If a minor child is the sole designated beneficiary of a separate share of the IRA, then the required annual withdrawals is based on the child's life expectancy, which of course is going to be very long. Um, and that will be the case until the child reaches the age of majority, which varies from state to state between 18 and 21. It's 18 in Florida. Uh, or if they're still in school, it could be up to age 26. Then, once they reach that age, then, um, then the 10-year rule kicks in, and the entire remaining IRA has to be withdrawn by the end of that 10-year period. So let's say it's uh, a minor child that's age nine when their parent dies, they inherit the IRA, and if the uh, age of majority that we're talking about is age 18, they can stretch it out up to age 18, and then at that point, 10-year period kicks in, so they have to take it all out by age 28. The third type of EDB is a person who is not more than 10 years younger. Kind of a tongue twister. A person who is not more than 10 years younger than the account owner who died. Think of a sibling beneficiary who is, let's say, six years younger than the account owner who died. This person also has to withdraw the required minimum distributions, the RMDs, based on their life expectancy. And you see, this exception was basically a concession by Congress that, was, uh, that, that, that really differentiated beneficiaries of the same generation level uh, as the account owner, uh, differentiating them from descendants like children. Um, importantly, the beneficiary does not need to be related in any way to the account owner in order to you know, qualify for this special category of EDB. The fourth kind is a disabled person. A disabled person can still stretch the inherited IRA over their lifetime. A person may qualify as disabled if he or she uh, is unable to engage in any what's called substantial gainful activity by reason of a medically determinable physical or mental impairment that can be expected to result in death or last for um, uh, one year or longer. The beneficiary does not have to be related to the account owner to qualify. And then the last category, the fifth category, similar to a disabled individual, is somebody who's chronically ill. A chronically ill person can continue to stretch the inherited IRA over their life expectancy. Now, a person may qualify as chronically ill if they're not able to perform at least uh, uh, what are called two activities of daily living, sometimes called ADLs, and if they can't do that for uh, 90 days or more without substantial assistance. And ADLs are things like you know, feeding, dressing, bathing, uh, uh, toileting, uh, walking, and so forth. Somebody can also qualify as chronically ill if they require substantial supervision due to a severe cognitive impairment. Let's say somebody has Alzheimer's. So those are the five special categories or groups of people that can continue to stretch. The rest of us, we're stuck with a 10-year payout rule. So what, what does this 10-year payout rule do? Well, it effectively accelerates the speed at which an inherited retirement account has to be liquidated. And it's, um, um, uh, you, you know, the account beneficiary will have to determine the best strategy for the withdrawal. Do they wait until the end of year 10? Year 10? Do they take some out equally over the 10 years? Do they take it all out in year one? Generally not a good idea because it's going to really increase the taxes in that year. But that decision will be based on their own income and tax bracket. But again, the account has to be fully liquidated by the end of uh, year 10. Again, that's 10 years after the death of the account owner. This means that the beneficiary will be required to take out larger amounts of money at once and be taxed on the larger distributed amount to boot. So as a consequence, again, this is just a money grab by the government. The federal treasury gets a piece of those withdrawals faster than in the past. Now, this has created some tricky times uh, for a trust, and the ramification of this change uh, they're significant for tax and estate planning purposes. Uh, you see, the new requirement is problematic for families with a trust, uh, where the trust is used as a beneficiary of the IRA instead of an individual person being named as the beneficiary, and that can be done. That's done quite often. Um, so if you're using a trust as a beneficiary, 
uh, again, which by the way is common, you're going to want your attorney to review the language of the trust now under the new law to avoid any unattended uh, bad tax consequences that may result from changes that were put in place by the SECURE Act. Um, so again, a thorough review of your trust agreement with an experienced uh, trust attorney like us here at Legacy Planning Law Group uh, would be prudent to identify any potential tax trap uh, for beneficiaries that have resulted as the consequences of this new SECURE Act. Now, some of the changes made by the SECURE Act are especially urgent to understand now as the coronavirus pandemic continues to pose a serious health risk. You know, mortality is a difficult thing to face and perhaps even more difficult to discuss with loved ones, but doing so is all the more important during this unique time in our history. Look, we all live busy lives, and uh, on the long list of to-dos, estate planning is often pushed down to the bottom, okay? However, changes in the law and COVID-19 provide a good reason to revise your estate planning to take care of your family in the future. So what are some planning steps you might consider taking right now in light of this new SECURE Act? Well, I'm going to suggest two. Number one, Name your spouse as the first beneficiary of your IRA. You know, previously, before this new SECURE Act, um, with an inherited IRA, it was sometimes logical to select not a spouse, but a beneficiary who was much younger than the spouse, let's say a child, especially if your spouse was not dependent on the income from the IRA to live on, and the money was ultimately going to be passed on to the next generation anyway. And that, you know, again, that allowed for additional uh, growth, tax favored, tax friendly growth of the balance that remained in the account. Some people even name their grandchildren or great grandchildren as beneficiaries of the IRA to even further reduce the required distributions that, that accompany the inherited IRA assets. Well, now with the SECURE Act, let's, let's look at it a little differently. This could be a good time to reconsider that strategy of not naming your spouse. Naming the spouse as the primary beneficiary of your IRA instead of a, a non-spouse like a child will allow them to continue the tax favored growth because again, why? A surviving spouse is one of the five types of special people, these eligible the EDBs that can continue to stretch it over their lifetime, okay? So the surviving spouse is not bound by the 10 year payout rule for withdrawals. Now, although the surviving spouse is still subject to uh, uh, RMDs from that account based on their life expectancy, those withdrawals will likely be less than what would um, you know, be required under, some, uh, under a 10-year withdrawal plan that uh, kids would be subject to. So that's uh, suggestion number one, naming your spouse as the primary beneficiary. How about suggestion number two, convert your traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. Now might be the, a great time to consider a Roth conversion, converting your IRA to a Roth IRA. When you convert a traditional IRA to a Roth, you typically roll over assets from an IRA into a Roth account. And when you do this, yes, you'll pay taxes on the withdrawal, but your remaining assets will grow tax-free after the conversion. All additional growth after the conversion is never taxed. Now, while Roth conversions have been an option uh, for retirees for some time, it may now be more beneficial than ever. With the SECURE Act, the delay in the RMDs will likely result in larger account balances, which could be more tax liability, let's say, to the kids upon withdrawal, especially if the kids are already, let's say, in their peak earning years. Passing on a Roth account has typically been a, a, group, a favorite way to pass money to the next generation. And now under the SECURE Act, a Roth IRA although still distributed in 10 years, is distributed tax-free. Your beneficiaries can let the Roth account grow, let it sit in there for the entire 10-year period, and then take it out at the end of 10 years with all that growth, all that increase in value. Take it out with no tax consequences. Now that the income schedule under the SECURE Act is accelerated for beneficiaries, it may be even more advantageous to pass along uh, Roth assets as opposed to traditional assets. Um, so, you know, thinking about whether to convert your traditional assets to a Roth, if you're thinking about it, you should consider things like your current tax bracket as well as the 
tax brackets of your beneficiaries. And if you think your beneficiaries, like the kids, will be in higher tax brackets than you are now, again, for example, the kids might be in their prime working years, then it may make sense to convert your traditional IRA to a Roth now, pay the tax at your lower rate compared to your kids' higher rate, okay? Now, of course, it's important to factor in the impact of you, the account owner, paying a large tax bill today, and the impact that may have on your retirement. Of course, the last thing you want is for your estate planning efforts to put your own retirement plans in jeopardy. So those are just some thoughts I have on, on, on how the SECURE Act can impact your estate planning. If you'd like to know more about how the SECURE Act might impact your estate planning, and if you'd like to know more about how perhaps we can help, we'd be happy to talk to you, okay? So you can book a free 15-minute phone call with our team. Just go to the, the main Facebook page, Legacy Planning Law Group, and select Book Now. This will give uh, you the chance to tell us what your concerns are and what your situation is, and also give both of us a chance to uh, see if we might be a good fit for each other. Again, the call is complimentary. You can book a call through the Facebook page, uh, or you can just uh, you know, Google us, LegacyPlanningLawGroup.com, or give us a call at uh, 904-880-5554. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Uh, this week, the topic, uh, How the Secure Act Impacts Estate Planning. I plan on giving another Facebook Live um, I'll talk next Thursday at about the same time. Again, it's part of our Thirsty Thursday series. Same time uh, and same day, different topics. So if you're thirsting for knowledge, we will quench your thirst. So this is Bill O'Leary signing off for now. And on behalf of the entire team here at, uh, uh, at, at Legacy Planning Law Group, a uh, team legacy, we want to thank you for spending time with us. And I do want you to go make it a great day.